Good morning.
Foothills Christian Church. We are so glad that you are here for worship, whether you're here in person in our sanctuary or joining us online. Here at Foothills, we are an open and affirming congregation where we seek to have our welcome wide and um, for those to have a sense of belonging here. If you, on your way in, if you're here, hopefully you grabbed some communion during the season of social distancing and best practices were using the individually wrapped communion t- so that will be used later in the service. And if you're here online, we invite you to participate by sharing in the comments, letting us know you are here. And at Foothills, we begin our time of worship with a call to worship. So at this time, I invite you to stand if possible and join me in the part that says all. We are called to follow Jesus. It will demand our dedication and our energy. Come, let us worship together, and may the peace of Christ be with you. And I invite you to remain standing as we sing together songs of praise.
We lift your name on high this morning, Lord. You are the everlasting God. We give all the glory and honor to you. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we come to this time of worship this morning gathered from so many different places. Some of us have come from a week filled with stress and hecticness. Some of us have come with hearts heavy with grief. Still others gather with hearts overflowing with joy. From wherever we have come, gather us together this morning, whether in this sanctuary or around our computer screens, that we may worship you with our whole hearts and mind. Let us set aside those things that would distract us, that we may lift our voices in praise. Open our hearts and minds that we may be open to hear your word for us today, transformed by your love. Through prayer and praise, through bread and wine, let us know that Christ is in our midst and communes with us. So we ask that you increase our faith, shower us with the gifts of your spirit. Help us to become more faithful servants in our thoughts and words and deed so that having worshiped together this day, we may go forth to share 
your generosity and grace with the world. This we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. And now I invite all the children to come forward to join me for a children's moment up by the steps. All right, good morning. It is good to see you. Last week was our first Sunday where we brought back our children's moment, and it's good to be here again. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about a story that's going to be heard in worship later, but it has to do with washing hands. Who's good at washing their hands? Have you gotten really good at it? When do you, when do you wash your hands? What are some times you wash your hands? Anyone, you can just shout it out. You really are just all saying it. So you're following my directions. So I just can't hear. Okay, before you go, go, before you eat, before you cook, Ari. What's up? Oh, when you're cleaning. Yeah. Okay, Cora. After you play. Oh, with your pet. Yeah. Izzy. After outside. Yeah, after you touch something dirty, after using the bathroom, after slime, yeah. Okay, two more. Before you eat, that's important. Okay, one more. After you what? Oh, after you are crafting. So there are just lots and lots of reasons you should wash your hands. And so at school, I bet you wash your hands all day. So Jesus was eating with some Pharisees, um, and they noticed that some of Jesus' disciples didn't wash their hands. And they're like, what? That is gross. Why don't you wash your hands? That's our tradition. But Jesus, he says, you know, it's important to do that, but it's also important um, that the things that we think and say and do, are those are clean too. So we don't want to do things like call people dirty names, or anything like that. But since we are all having to wash our hands a lot, I thought we'd practice, because there's, maybe you have different ways at school, but if they, when you wash your hands, you should scrub them for not just two seconds, you should do it for maybe like 20 or 30 seconds. So here, take one of these and pass it down. So you can take this to your home and put it in your bathroom. I'll take one. So pass those around, and then we're going to do it, because, um, In church, every Sunday, we pray the Lord's Prayer, and that's about the same amount of time that it takes to wash our hands. And so I'm going to give you some hand sanitizer, and we're going to practice, okay? Put your hands out. Our floor is going to get sanitized, too, it looks like. Here's some... Oh, I got your pants. I'm sorry. Okay, so keep your, and we're going to scrub it in just a second, but you can go ahead and start if you. With your hands. All right, so some of you might already know this prayer, and if you don't know this prayer, this will be a good way to practice. Here, Clay, would you like some sanitizer? Okay. Okay. All right, so you can repeat. If you can read, you can say this with me. Okay. So will you pray with me? And we'll have the church help too, because it's okay if they say the Lord's Prayer twice today. Okay, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Did anyone rub their hands the whole time? Yeah. Okay. Well, so you can take this home and you can practice. And that way you'll learn the Lord's Prayer too. Now you are invited to go to Worship of Wonder or Kingdom Kids or back to the adults you came with. Oh, you didn't get one? Did you get one? 
Once again, we go to God in prayer this morning, and this is the prayer where we'll lift up our joys and concerns all and pause first to have a moment for us to pray for our concerns, and the second moment of silence will be for our joys. You can speak a name out loud during that time or pray silently if you prefer, and then we'll use our voices together for the Lord's Prayer for the second time. And um, things to keep in prayer this morning, it's great to see Shane. He had open heart surgery just a week ago, and so it's great that you are here in prayers for your recovery. <laughs> and a prayer of joy is that um, Jimmy Gone is with us. Jimmy Gone is Jim Gone's son, and um, a grew up here at this church, was ordained in this church, and he's traveling across country to go to his next appointment, or I'm not military, so I don't know the language of how you say it, but okay. <laughs> so it's great. It's a joy to have you with us this morning as well. Oh. Will you pray with me? 
Creator God, you made the earth and the universe and all that is in it. Out of all the sto stars, we know only one better than the others. Of all the planets formed, we have only touched one. But we are so in awe of you. You, almighty one, maker of us all, help us to never lose that sense of wonder and amazement. You, O oh God, are our hope and our refuge. In our distress, we come quickly to you. This weekend, we come remembering those whose lives were lost in New York, D.C., and Pennsylvania. We are mindful of the sacrifice of public servants who demonstrated the sacrifice of the greatest love by laying down their lives for others. We commit their souls to your eternal care and celebrate their gifts. We come remembering and we come in hope, not in ourselves, but in you. As foundations we once thought secure have been shaken, we are reminded of the illusion of security. In commemorating this tragedy, we give you thanks for your presence in times of need. And we lean on you to point us towards the path of peace. We come praying to you this morning, full of concerns that race through our mind and weigh heavily on our hearts. Hear now our prayers of concern. Hear our prayers, O God. You, O God, you meet us each day with new mercies. So we give thanks for the ways that you continue to show up in our lives day after day, hour after hour. We give thanks for the way the Holy Spirit moves amongst us, nudges us to see the hope that is all around us. Hear now our prayers of joy. Hear our prayers, O God, and gather up the ones spoken and those held within our hearts as we continue to pray, saying together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm reading from Psalm 54, and I'm reading out of the Good News Bible, so you will see a few words different. Save me by your power, O God. Set me free by your might. Hear my prayer, O God, and listen to my words. Proud men are coming to attack me. Cruel men are trying to kill me, men who do not care about God. But God is my helper. The Lord is my defender. May God use their own evil to punish my enemies. God will destroy them because the Lord is faithful. I will gladly offer you a sacrifice, O Lord. I will give you thanks because you are good. You have rescued me from all my troubles, and I have seen my enemies defeated. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. 
Uh, it's nice to be here. Um, I've been on a little vacation. Yeah. Um, so if you don't know, um, my son had COVID, and uh, then kind of one by one, we all got it. And before you ask, yes, those of us who could were vaccinated. We still got it. It was quite unpleasant. I don't recommend it. Um, but because we didn't get it at the same time, um, it, it was a very long quarantine that we were in. And, and two of our kids actually never got it, which is interesting. Um, so, so I've been gone. And it's, it's kind of like Becca took a sabbatical, and then she came back, and then I took a sabbatical. But mine was not as fun, I think. Um, and so I was meant to preach this sermon about a month ago, and, uh, and, and we delayed it, and we delayed it, and, and so um, we're doing it today. And I am part of a clergy group online that Kathy actually invited me to. It's a Facebook group for ministers and disciples of Christ, and there was a question posted to the group a while ago that said, what is something that Jesus said that you wish he never said? Um, which is a very disciples sort of question, because usually we don't like to admit there are things that Jesus said that we wish he hadn't said. And the passage that we're reading today is what came to mind for me, um, especially as I was at home with COVID. So uh, let us start. We're going to be in Mark 7, verses 1 through 8, 14 through 15, and 21 through 23. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, and folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. This is the word of the Lord. I think it would be really easy to interpret this as a statement that we don't need to wash our hands. And, and while I was home with COVID, and, and my, not all my kids had it yet, I was pretty frantically washing my hands, um, pretty frequently so that they were raw. I, you know, I'm preparing meals. I'm still a mom and, and washing my hands almost excessively and thinking, oh, Jesus, why did you say this? And this is really one of those times where we say, this is why we take the Bible seriously, but not literally. We have to interpret it in the context in which it's written so that we really understand what it's saying and what's happening. So let's look at the context here. We're in Mark. Um, Becca was actually right in the similar spot last week. Jesus' ministry is growing. He's got a lot of followers. His cousin has just been murdered, and he's tired, and the disciples are tired. And so they retreat. But what happens when they retreat is people follow them, and, and so they continue to serve, and they feed the 5,000, and uh, Jesus tries to retreat by himself, but there's a storm, and the disciples get scared, so he has to walk on water to get to them, right? So, so these folks are exhausted, and so they find a way to retreat and, and to have a meal, and they just want to eat. 
But these religious leaders come up to them and they say, why didn't you wash your hands before you eat? And I can just imagine that frustration, right? If, if you've been in a service job and you're trying so hard and somebody comes up to you and says, that, I found a mistake. That is kind of how they're feeling. And when I read this story, I like to side with the disciples. Like, there's good guys and bad guys, right? Um, but I don't think there are good guys and bad guys. I think there are two groups of people, and they're struggling. So, so just as we say, wow, the Jesus and the disciples are tired, uh, the Pharisees and the scribes are also tired, but even more tired, like exhausted level of tired. One thing that we've seen a lot in the pandemic is an increase in OCD, um, obsessive compulsive disorder. And it's, it's a condition that's really poorly understood because people always say, oh, my OCD is kicking in, and that means they're like really organized. That's actually not OCD, right? It's a pretty serious condition where folks have really high anxiety, and I'm, I'm going to talk about it just briefly because I'm going to run the risk of, of oversimplifying it. But essentially, when people have OCD, is they have a lot of worry about something that they feel like they can't control. And so as a way of managing that worry, they will control something else that they can control. And when they control that thing, even though it's completely unrelated, they feel a sense of relief. And as soon as they have that sense of relief, it reinforces that behavior, and then, and then they keep doing it. And it's really hard, actually, to get out of that cycle. So I'm going to suggest that the Pharisees and the scribes have this generational OCD. Okay, so if we read Jewish history, and, and they're really good at documenting, so we can do that, uh, we find that the Jewish people are conquered over and over, and they're taken captive, and they're sent to exile over and over and over. And when we read what they've written, we can find out that the way that they interpreted this over and over and over is because there was a spiritual failing. You failed spiritually, and that's why you were taken over. Not because the other army was bigger, not because they were more powerful, not because they had better military strategy, but because you sinned. And so it creates this responsibility on the religious leaders who actually are not the best military strategists. Right? It would be as if the president called up Becca and said, hey, I've got a sting operation, can you give me some advice? But not moral advice, not religious advice, but tactical advice. Um, I'm, I don't think she's the best person to ask about that, right? But, but this is the responsibility that is being placed on the religious leaders. Whenever something happens, it falls on them. And so for generations, they're trying to cope with this anxiety. And so what they do is they come up with rules, right? So, so there's some initial rules that they're given. But those don't seem to be stopping it, so let's add some more. Oh, that, must, that must really mean this, and that must really mean this. And, and so by the time we get to Jesus, we've just got rules on top of rules on top of rules. And they spend so much of their time focused on following the rules that they forget the intention behind the rules, which is to care for others and to love God. But it's obsessive. And they can't break out of it. And, and what's worse is regular people don't care. They're, they're not really doing it, right? So it's not like they're saying, well, you have to wash your hands before you eat. It's like, well, you have to follow this exact ritual before you eat to wash your receptacles and your hands and your food. And it's extremely time consuming. And people don't have time for that because they have jobs and lives and everything. And so they're really not doing it which actually just makes the religious leaders more anxious because now they have to do it more to sort of cover for everybody. And so here's Jesus, who's becoming a very popular religious leader, and his disciples aren't doing it. And so I imagine that level of anxiety where they're like, look, we have to do this or something bad is going to happen. And Jesus can't he can't really cure this in this moment with them. They're not open to suggestion. So he turns to his followers, 
And he says, it is not what you put in that defiles, it is what is already in. And by that, he is not giving medical advice, he's giving spiritual advice. And so when I read through this, this list, um, let, me, let me read it again. These are the, the things that are evil that Jesus says. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, and folly. And when I read that list, the one that usually stands out to me is murder. And I'm like, cool. I hardly ever do that. (laughs) So I feel pretty good about that. Um, I looked up licentiousness because I wasn't completely sure on that. And and it means kind of lacking moral or sexual restraint. And so generally we could see folks who are sexually harming other people, and I'm pretty good at not doing that. Um, When I'm at the self-checkout, I always am like really sure to scan every item. So I'm not worried about theft, right? So I look at this list and I'm like, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. Um, there's, There's some on here that when I look a little closer are a little bit more of a struggle, um, like envy. And and when I see envy on this list, I get kind of annoyed because I'm like, envy doesn't come from within. Obviously, it comes from outside because I see the things outside that I want, and that makes me feel envious. If I didn't see those things, I wouldn't have envy. Actually, I I was home for about a month, and I, I had a lot less envy because I wasn't seeing things, except for then I saw all of you on Facebook. And then I felt envy because you were doing things. But that wasn't from within me. That was from Facebook right? That's Facebook's fault. It, it's hard, right? Some of these things on this list are, are kind of hard. And, and I said this over the summer, we talked about, uh, we as humans, we kind of have this belief that says, I'm not good enough. And the lie is not the belief. The lie is that you have to be good enough. Because the truth is, we're going to fail. And Life is messy. And when we just accept that, we're going to make mistakes and we're going to fail. But what are the things that are important? Are we loving God and are we loving others? Then we correct and we get back on the right track. So so Jesus is saying, look, you focus on the wrong things. You know, if if I have a belief that I'm not enough, then I'm like, you know what, I need a better car. But as soon as I get a better car, I see somebody else whose car is better than mine, and so I, I need to get that car. And I maybe get the absolute best car, but I have spent all my money on that, and so I don't have a very nice house at that point, and so I, I'm going to um, be really anxious about that. It's actually the exact same thing that the Pharisees and religious leaders are doing. It's the exact same thing. We're focusing on something else to distract us from the real thing. And the real thing is really complicated, and that's why we really don't want to look at it. It's really messy to be a follower of God. Because we have to confront this sense that we have of not being enough and still jump in and serve and love and do it anyway. And Jesus is like, yeah, right on. Let's jump in and let's be messy. One of the words on this list is folly. Folly means foolishness. The opposite of foolishness is wisdom. Um, not knowledge, wisdom. And, and I don't know about you, but if, if somebody says to me, from now on you must be wise, um, that's going to take some time, right? Because the, how do we get to wisdom? Only through time and experience. And so we know that this list does not mean you shall do this immediately right now. It means when your heart is with God, these are the places that you go. These are the things that you want to avoid because your heart is right. But you will still do these things sometimes. You will still experience envy. You will still be foolish. But you're going in the right direction. What are the things in your life that distract you 
from the messiness of serving God? What are the things that you feel like, I can control that? And as soon as you do, you get that sense of relief, and it tricks you into recognizing that you failed to love your neighbor. It's so messy. But Jesus is calling us to turn from the rituals and the empty traditions to a life that is loving and complicated. And and how weird that we're about to move into a time of communion, which is a ritual. And the Christian church, over time, has sometimes done exactly that with communion um, because it, it needs to be done a certain way, right? It, um, the, the leader has to stand here and they have to wear this and they have to say these words and the elements have to be these things and only these people can participate but these people cannot participate. And it gives us a feeling of control but it's, it's not the right thing that we're supposed to be controlling. So rituals in themselves can be really good things. And, and I think when it comes to communion, it, um, COVID may have been good for us a little bit because we, we get stuck in, um, this is how I like to do it. I recently had a, a meeting with my ordination committee and talking about how communion has changed. And even one of the people in my committee was like, yeah, but really, this really is the best way. And we're, we're going to get back to that um, because it's so hard. For us, we, we have our preferences. And so this is our way of, of pushing out of our comfort zone. If you're at home, communion might consist of a French fry and a soda. And that's completely fine. Um, and it's tastier than, than what we're doing here, I promise. Uh, because it's not the ritual. It's not those things. It's the heart of it. So as we join together in communion, we remember that we are children of God and our neighbors are children of God. And even though it's messy, we jump in. Just what?
The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took a cup also after supper, saying, This is my blood shed for you. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, we confess our need for you today. You know all that we are burdened with during this troubling times. We need your healing and your grace. We need hope restored. Help us turn our worry time to prayer time. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord. Remind us daily that you love us so much that you gave your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, so that we may be saved by your grace, love, and mercy, and that the promise of eternal life with you. We thank you, Jesus, for enduring so much pain and suffering for our salvation. Please lead us in your righteous ways in all things we ask you, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.
In one of the churches that I served as an interim pastor, it was on the campus of Oklahoma State University. We often had international students, but one of the couples who worshiped with us regularly was from Ukraine. She was the PhD Fulbright um, Fellowship visiting professor and spoke very good English, but her husband spoke little English at all. And one day she shared with me what his most important favorite part of worship was. She said, it's when you raise your hands to offer the blessing to leave. I thought, oh no. <laughs> he doesn't understand much at all about what's going on in worship, but he got that signal that it was time to go. So I took a risk and asked her what he was thinking about that, and her answer was not what I thought. He says he feels a great connection to God and to one another at that time, and that even though he doesn't understand the words of prayer that you're offering, he does understand that it means not only is God present with us here, but God is with us as we go. Kind of changes the whole thing a little bit. We're all called to offer up to others the blessing of God. God's blessing's not just for us, it's for others as well. So as we share ourselves, we share our resources, we share our offerings, we are able in one way to share the blessings of God's love with others. Sometimes those offerings and volunteerism is used right in the local congregation to support staff and maintain facilities and to develop programs so we to understand what the blessings of God are about. Other times we're asked to volunteer or to share our resources so that we can meet the needs of neighbors around us. And still at other times we're asked to go beyond and meet broader needs. Now is one of those times in which we have the opportunity to share together in the Week of Compassion Funds and meet the needs of some who are fleeing Afghanistan or the terrors of Hurricane Ida. But no congregation can do this alone. We join together in this offering with other disciples of Christ congregations, but it doesn't stop there. We join together our Week of Compassion Funds with the one great hour of sharing funds of all many different denominations, and together those funds multiply so that we can meet the needs. This year's theme is Let Love Flow. As we contribute those funds, we allow the love of God to flow out into the blessings of others. In tangible ways, they see that blessing of God's love. Having been in two congregations who have received those funds, they truly are tangible gifts of God's love flowing to us in those moments. Here at Footdales, we don't pass an offering plate, but we do have a box in the back that you can make your contribution, whether it's to this congregation or to the Week of Compassion. You can also give online or by text. In a moment, Pastor Janelle is going to come and stand up and raise her hand or her hands in blessing. And as we prepare to leave this place, we are reminded that as we go forth, not only do we receive God's blessings, but it is up to us to share those blessings that God's love may flow. Thank you for your offerings. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you to all of your generous gifts that support the mission and ministry of our church. We are grateful 
for the, all of them. Um, some things to lift up in the life of our church. We invite all families with children and youth to stay um, and join us in the Fellowship Hall. There's going to be an open house for youth and children's ministries and some goodies over there too I saw my eye on. Um, so even if you're here without youth or children and you have some at home that are just not here or know of others, or you're just curious, we invite you to head over there um, to learn more about what's in store th this year for youth and children's ministry. On Tuesday, there's going to be a mom's lunch out at Tika Shack at noon. So if you are in that demographic, we invite you to that and find more information um, on our Facebook page and church website. And um, something that our church, one of our outreach efforts that has been on pause for a little bit is refugee resettlement. Um, in past years, we part, were partnered with a new arriving refugee family about once a quarter and organized our efforts to set up an apartment and then walk alongside the case manager to um, provide any needs. There is going to be a great need of that. Again, um, international travel was paused for a long time, but now um, Phoenix is anticipating quite a bit of new refugees, especially from Afghanistan. And so um, our church has been called to help in that way again. But since it's been over a year since we've done that, let me know if you're interested in serving in that way, because um, those who would like to do that need to partake in a tr training by the Refugee Resettlement Agency. It's an hour and it's online, but let me know if you're interested. And another request um, since we are going to be keep an eye out on furniture or household items, because a sign-up sheet will be coming out um, with a list of donation needs. But the Kozman family, Casey and Sam, are recently moving into a new house, and they have quite a bit of furniture they could offer, but they have no way to store it. So if you're someone who has an empty garage, um, let me know so that we could help secure those donations in the meantime as well. Now I'd like to invite Brandon and Carol, reader, to come forward if you don't mind. So um, Carol and Brandon are up here for different reasons, um, but let's see. Okay, so Carol is up here. Today is her final Sunday before she moves to Sturgis, South Dakota. Is that correct? Okay, I knew Sturgis, but I wasn't sure which state it was in. Um, and so we want to send her off with a farewell and our prayers. We know that she'll be back, though, because her daughter and granddaughter are here. And so we hope every time she comes back to visit, it'll be on a Sunday, and we'll get to see her at Foothills. But, Carol, we give thanks for the ways you've served as an elder and the, before that as a Monday service group coordinator and just countless ways. And so our prayers go with you, and we will miss you terribly, but we will keep our eye out for you when you're back visiting. And Brandon Beckham has been our church administrative assistant for f over four years now, and we give so much thanks to um, all that she has done in that position. She, her last day in the office was on Friday, so she's no longer a member of our church staff, but she's very much a member of Foothills, and so you are going to continue to see Brandon, but we wanted to take a moment to share our gratitude for her service for these past four years. So for both of you, we have a chalice so that to share our gratitude and to help think of your time, whether working or um, as an active member here to take with you. And then Brandon, Linda Seawald is our community life um, chair and she organized some um, tokens of appreciation. And so we wanted to give those to you as well. And now I'd like to offer a prayer for both of you. Will you pray with me? Oh, loving and generous God, we give thanks for the ministry and service of Brandon and Carol. We ask as this time of transition for both of them that your spirit will be with them, that you will pour out upon them grace upon grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. And now is the time in our service where we offer a call to discipleship. So if there's anyone here looking for a new church to call home, we gladly welcome you. You're invited to come forward if you'd like to join um, as we sing together our final song. I invite you to stand if able and let us join our voices one more time in praise.
Let us keep our focus on God as we leave and we jump into the messiness that God created. Let us forget the distractions and focus on loving each other and loving God. May the love of God, may the peace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you. Amen.